It was one of the most stunning political careers the world has ever known. And it all began with a carpet. In the year 48 BC, a king's sister is smuggled past the soldiers of her brother and then laid before the feet of the Roman emperor, Caesar. She was 21 years old, not particularly pretty, but extremely ambitious. She wants nothing less than to be crowned Queen of Egypt. Whether it was out of passion or calculation remains her secret, but either way, her name has lingered in history, Cleopatra. Life was as intricate, colorful, and exotic as this ancient mosaic. A Macedonian Greek by origin, Cleopatra was intent on making history. But after a glorious rise to power, her life ended tragically. In this mosaic, we can see Berenike, one of Cleopatra's ancestors. She started the dynasty, and her eyes already seem to know what lies ahead. Love and war a glorious rise to power, a tragic end. Writers from Shakespeare to Shaw have written about her. Egypt, the land of Cleopatra. Then as now, really just a sandy desert. But suddenly, right in the middle of it, fertile country. Egypt, the biblical country, the land of milk and honey, where there was always plenty to eat. Almost the whole of the ancient world drew on its natural resources. It is the River Nile that turns this barren desert into an earthly paradise. Worshipped as the god Happy, ancient legends say its source lies in paradise. It brought wealth to the region, enabling the pharaohs to bathe in glory and Cleopatra to bask in splendor. The Nile is the lifeblood of Egypt. In Cleopatra's time, Egypt was a rich country where crops flourished and wine was plentiful. The inhabitants are shown as strong Greek wrestlers Greece, the dominant cultural force in the ancient world, had left its mark in Egypt as elsewhere. This was the age of those two dominant intermingling cultures, the Greek and the Egyptian. In the middle of the desert is the grave of Petrosiris, an ancient Egyptian official. His final resting place gives us one tiny clue to the secret of this long vanished era. Very little is known about the Cleopatran epoch or about the Egyptian queen herself and the complex, colorful life she led. For a long time, this weathered bust and the records of some ancient writers contradicting one another were all historians knew about Cleopatra. She was many things. She was a great beauty, a witch with magical powers, a shrewd politician, a whore, a genius. She was black. But all writers agree that she was born in 69 BC and died 39 years later. They also agree that a woman of intrigue she tried to resurrect the kingdoms of the pharaohs, first with Caesar, then with Anthony, but failed tragically. 300 years before Cleopatra was born, Alexander the Great liberated Egypt from Persian occupation. This was the start of the Hellenistic epoch. This enormously big mosaic 
documents the moment in the battle when Darius, king of the Persians, realizes that defeat is close at hand. He flees in panic. It consists of more than four million tiny colored stones, a tribute to a man who conquered almost the whole world, only to die young of malaria after he was bitten by a tiny insect. The warrior to the left of Alexander could be Ptolemy, his general and friend, also called the savior. He became king of Egypt following Alexander's death, starting the dynasty of the Ptolemies. Their reign is a tale of incest, intrigue, and murder. The sister of Ptolemy II, Arsinoe, had the son of her first husband killed. She then married her own half-brother, who in turn had her children killed. She then wed her full brother, and the two of them were revered as a divine couple on gold coins like these. But Ptolemy IV secured his claim to power by having his mother, brother, and uncle executed. But Ptolemy VII had his own son hacked to pieces before his eyes. And but Ptolemy XI strangled his wife single-handedly after only 19 days of matrimony. Cleopatra is the last in the line of this tradition. She is the seventh to bear that name and will also dispose of her brother. Who was this young woman? We don't know the exact face of Cleopatra because we know only descriptions from Roman and Greek people living in Rome. So we have only criticism about Cleopatra and, not, and reflections about her character, but not any depiction of her own character. It's only reflex uh, by, she, she was a lady who, who made the conquest of Caesar and of Mark Antonius, so she was very bad for the Roman people. And so nobody from Alexandria made any de de depiction of her character and of her face. For the Roman people, she was a Negro. But in fact, she was a Macedonian woman with hair, blonde hair and uh, white face. And so we have no picture of Cleopatra. Cleopatra's own life is inextricably linked with the history of her time. Then, an emerging power in the Mediterranean region, Rome already plays a major part in the ancient world's affairs. It is now well on its way to world dominance. Within half a century, Rome had turned Africa, Greece, Gaul, and Spain into dependent vassal territories. Cleopatra knows she has nothing to counter Rome's military might, but she also knows the classic alternative, the policy of alliance. Rome, although highly armed and a military giant, is disrupted over national policy and weakened by controversial domestic affairs. Only with its military force is Rome able to rule the world. But the cultural center of the Mediterranean and the world is Cleopatra's Alexandria, with a million inhabitants of diverse origins. Cleopatra's Egypt, tradition and culture stretching back thousands of years. Edifices built by the pharaoh strike every stranger dumb with awe. Caesar is said to have wept for shame when comparing these magnificent buildings with Rome's own miserable architecture. Alexandria was the seat of the Ptolemy's dynasty, opulent and grandly laid out. Rome, by comparison, must have seemed like a wretched dump. You can still find the Queen of the Nile in the streets where tourists stroll, in the souvenir shops. She is painted in gold, but has no face. We seem to know everything, yet nothing about her. Down the ages, artists haven't painted an historically true picture of her, but a figment of their imagination. Artists, hundreds of them, created hundreds of Cleopatras. 
But who was she really? The legends surrounding her hide her true identity like a veil covering her face. She is still a mystery today. This marble bust was discovered only 20 years ago. Experts say this has to be the real face of Cleopatra. With its help, we will try to unravel her true identity. She did not have an easy childhood. Her father, Ptolemy XII, was called Oilites, the flute player. Wrapped in transparent, veil-like robes, he was more interested in music than politics. Only by paying vast sums and bribes to Rome could he cling to his power. The consequence of this for Egypt was higher taxes. This 2,000-year-old record lists everything that can be taxed. There was a tax on pedestrians, a levy on prostitution, and everything in between. Cleopatra must have learned very early on how painful it was to be tied to Rome. Cleopatra's Alexandria. Today, it lies 10 meters underground. This is how deep you have to burrow to find traces of that city and you won't always be as successful as the French archaeologists of this dig. They found an archaeological sensation in what they call the Cleopatra layer. It's a column with inscriptions, messages from antiquity. This doesn't happen every day. The search for archaeological material of this caliber has been going on here for more than six months. Now, all concerned, help to bring this treasure to safety. The columns are well preserved and the inscription can be deciphered with the naked eye. It reads, Sebastian the Greek word for Caesarian, Caesar's domicile. From this archaeological find, we can deduce that this must have been the location of Caesarian Square. And from the writings of the time, we know that Cleopatra's palace stood to the north of here. In other words, in what is today the Bay of Alexandria. The port of Alexandria. Amid the bustle, the colorful scenery, and the many fishing boats, we prepare to embark on our search for the remains of Cleopatra's palace. We have persuaded the head of the French dig, Professor Empereur, to join us in our bid to find these 2,000-year-old ruins underwater. This part of the bay has never been explored by archaeologists before and the police have granted us permission to dive in this restricted military area for only half a day. We are taking our underwater camera with us. This is where the ancient palace must have stood until the early Middle Ages. Then the land subsided and the water level of the Mediterranean rose, flooding these ruins. After 10 years of excavation work in Alexandria, Professor Empereur knows by instinct the best places to explore. And our depth sounder will display any unusual elevations on the seabed. It's late afternoon. We are about a kilometer away from the coast. We find a spot that looks promising. The echo sounder shows large boulders down below. And the map says this is a potential location for ancient ruins. We make final preparations before diving. This could be a first encounter with the now sunken world of the Ptolemies. Nobody has ever been here before with a TV camera. This map explains the purpose of our expedition. This is what Alexandria Bay looks like today, and the points show where Cleopatra's palace must have stood. This is where we dive. We're in luck, and at 
a first attempt. At a depth of only eight meters, we find upended, toppled columns lying on the bed covered with algae alongside their stone pedestals. The palace grounds must have been enormous. A whole landscape of toppled columns is just waiting to be rediscovered. We disturb virtually nothing in our first journey to the sunken palace, merely scratching bits of algae off the stone. The exploration of this archaeological treasure trove must be the job of future expeditions. A palace stairway perhaps lies behind the columns in the background. And there, the underside of an upturned body of a sphinx. Somewhere around here, Cleopatra must have met the most powerful man of her time, just over 2,000 years ago. Somewhere around here, the mighty emperor must have unrolled that carpet, and the story of Caesar and Cleopatra unfolded with it. Caesar was ambitious, intelligent, and ruthless. This is concealed, however, in his striking busts. In reality, he was suffering from epilepsy, tooth decay, and hair loss. It was not only the hunt for his rival Pompey, but his unrelenting thirst for money which brought him to Egypt. He was 52 years old when he landed on the coast of the Pharaohs in October 48 BC. This was Caesar's first encounter with a wealthy metropolis. It must have come as something of a culture shock. Never before had he encountered anything like it. Alexandria, the golden city on the coast, a melting pot of cultures, with traders and dealers, and those anxious to make their fortune, a city of a million faces. So many women that even the sky cannot count as many stars. How did Cleopatra treat Caesar, the Roman soldier who was bedazzled by such splendor? Was his interest in Egypt merely political? Or was it this face that bewitched him? With the help of coins like these, experts have been able to pronounce this bust genuine. They have, however, yet to analyze the paint substances applied to the head. At the Antiquity Collection in Berlin, Professor Riederer prepares to analyze a sample of the hair dye. The tiniest fragments are enough to determine the nature, age, and origin of a substance. A barely visible dye particle dissolved in acetone is subjected to molecular chromatography. The analysis has detected an organic dye stuff, which evidently dyed the hair brown. This could be evidence of Cleopatra's Macedonian origins. Dyes were used extensively in Cleopatra's time for cosmetic purposes, 
As the discovery of numerous makeup vessels shows, these splendid objects are not just of interest to museums, they are a great help to the analytical archaeologist. Even the tiniest amounts of their original contents can be analyzed for their origin and chemical composition. A milligram of powder scratched from the inside of a container is enough to tell us what Cleopatra used to make herself up. The analysis is done using x-rays. Each substance has its own unique molecular structure. X-rays can penetrate these structures, but these rays are deflected in different ways, depending on the substance. At 30 kilovolts, we obtain an analysis profile, a sort of fingerprint of the substance we are looking at. Here, we see the makeup is a mixture of soot and galena. Galena, a lead ore, was the basis for makeup in antiquity. It can be poisonous. Ground with a mortar and pestle, it was added to the soot, giving it a seductive shimmer. Although parading as a chic Egyptian, Cleopatra was actually following Greek fashion. The eyes were touched up in black, but the stroke at the corner of the eyes was not nearly so pronounced as Hollywood would have liked us to believe. There were red oxides of various metals which were applied with small wooden sticks. These substances could also be poisonous, hence the legend that Cleopatra didn't kill herself with venom from a snake, but poisoned herself accidentally with her makeup. An unlikely theory because, although these substances may have been dangerous, they had been in regular use for centuries. The crown of Egyptian makeup was nut oil. It was often scented and gave the hair and the skin, in particular, a greasy shine. Cleopatra welcomed Caesar probably wearing this makeup. Together, they embarked on a voyage of luxury along the Nile. To her, Caesar was a lover and someone who would keep her in power. However, this was not just a lover's pleasure cruise, but a demonstration of Egyptian superiority. Look upon this wonderful Egypt, Caesar, of which I am queen. It was literally a swimming palace. 120 meters long. There was a 12 meter high superstructure made of ebony, gold, and silver fittings, and a small silk sail. This miracle of ancient technology was accompanied and towed by rowboats. For almost two months, the most powerful man in the world turns tourist, neglecting the affairs of state. Caesar visits Memphis, the pyramids, Saqqara, and Luxor. And he arrives in Dendera, a city in Upper Egypt where the Cleopatra dynasty built itself a mighty temple. It's dedicated to Hathor, the goddess with the cow's ears. This is where the Ptolemy dynasty is worshipped as gods. The huge dimensions of this temple must have confused Caesar but it must have been even more baffling for him to learn that this was where Cleopatra was worshipped as a god while she was still alive. A ruler turned god. Caesar could only dream of such triumphs. Rome, more than conscious of its status as a republic, denied him such an honor. On the back wall of the temple, we find carved in stone for all time, the Pharaoh's last laugh. According to the inscription on the cartouche, 
This is a picture of Cleopatra with the robes and bearings of one of the rulers of Egypt. This is how they were immortalized for thousands of years. In her hands, she holds the insignia of the Egyptian divine. At her side is her son, Caesarion, the love child. But was this Caesarion really the son of Caesar, as Cleopatra maintained? Or was this an act of pretense by a power-hungry politician intent on binding herself closer to Caesar, and thereby Alexandria to Rome? Was Cleopatra a loving mother or a cunning swindler? Of course, no doubt he is her son. No doubt about that. It's quite clear in the text, you know. But I do believe within between the lines, you know, from the texts, because this is in a way my field, that he is the son of Caesar. Uh, I don't have evidence from the text, uh, but I think uh, she loved this great leader and um, she had to do some politics with him. Uh, I, I cannot say that she was deceiving him or something like that, but uh, she believed in his character and his quality. And uh, I think, uh, well, they got for the history and for us, this son, Caesarion, and I do believe that, his legal, that he is his legal son. Rome was deeply alarmed. The prospect of a half-Egyptian son conceived in wedlock as successor to Caesar in a large Roman-Egyptian empire horrified Roman politicians. Consternation and resistance were rising. This we learned from the letters they wrote. Senator Cicero said, I hate this queen and Propats called her a king's harlot. Others insisted that Egypt should be turned into a Roman province, sending in troops if necessary. Rome owed its position in the world to its armies. The deeds of soldiers were glorified on triumphal arches such as these. But Caesar's Rome was far from being that magnificent city now known as the ancient Rome. Caesar's Rome was made of mud, a big village that didn't justify its claim as the center of the world. Those impressive large buildings at the Forum date from the time of these later Roman emperors. Caesar's Rome was way behind Alexandria. It was haphazard and catastrophic. The streets were too narrow, the buildings dilapidated, it stank, and disease was rampant. Under the influence of the Egyptian splendors he had seen, Caesar began to plan new grandiose buildings. This was to be the site of a new palace on the Palatine Hill above the Vesta Temple. From here, he could enjoy a view of the Rome of his fantasies. From here, he could see beyond the city limits to the other side of the River Tiber, where his visitors from Egypt, confident of their status, had taken up quarters. They were Queen Cleopatra and her small son Caesarion. The Romans were scandalized. Cleopatra was to reside for two years at what is today the Villa Farnes. It was said she had 300 servants and wallowed in Oriental luxury at a time when the citizens of Rome were forced by law to lead a life of austerity. Cleopatra's stay caused public uproar. After all, Caesar was a married man, and his refusal to give up his foreign mistress raised political resistance. All this must have contributed to the events of the 15th of March in the year 44 BC. Caesar was having nightmares. He gets up early for a meeting of the Senate. But he feels unwell, and his wife, Calpurnia, fears disaster. But then the Senate messengers arrive, and Caesar reluctantly pulls himself together. Some say Caesar is literally dragged away from his villa. On the street, a friend of Caesar's bars his way. He knows about the assassination plot and has written down the details. He hands over a scroll to Caesar, which remains unread. It was a brilliantly planned and timed assassination. Here, at what is today the so-called Cat Forum on the steps of the former Curia, Caesar was welcome to the meeting. This is where he met his doom. 
A senator steps forward and asks for mercy for his brother, who has been banished. Caesar turns down this plea. In anger, the senator tears at Caesar's toga, the agreed signal for the conspirators. Blood spurts onto the marble floor. One after another, 60 senators take their turns to stab Caesar. The toga over his head, Caesar gives in to his fate and falls to the ground. Caesar is dead. The conspirators flee. A catastrophe for the Roman Empire and Cleopatra. Her dream of an enlarged Roman Egyptian Empire so close to coming true is now ruined forever. She must have been deeply despaired, but is not completely crushed. The day will come when death will be her only way out. She flees Rome across the sea to the safety of her city, to Alexandria. The bad news of Caesar's death spreads through the streets like wildfire. But Alexandria is not in danger. Rome, as yet, is far too preoccupied with itself to threaten others. Aware that her days could well be numbered, Cleopatra indulges once more in her Alexandrian taste for boundless luxury. And once again, she dazzles a Roman soldier with gold and precious stones. It is Anthony, the self-appointed successor to Caesar. In his Venetian fresco, the painter Tiepolo depicts the old legend which tells of a feast given for Anthony, the new Roman ruler, where Cleopatra dissolved her largest and most beautiful pearl in wine and then proceeded to drink it. This display of luxury impresses the soldier Anthony. It won't be long until he falls to the temptations of the Orient. New coins now change hands in Alexandria. On one side, Cleopatra. On the other, Anthony. He is far more enraptured by Egypt and its glory than Caesar ever was. Under Anthony's influence, the culture and customs of the Orient are dispersed throughout the whole of the Eastern Roman Empire. It is the reign of Dionysus, the god of wine and fertility. The Greek god Dionysus is about to conquer the world. In Alexandria's palaces, there are intoxicating orgies, festivities which make Anthony forget his responsibilities. This belonged to the cult of Dionysus, a mysterious oriental force? At the foot of Mount Vesuvius, we find one of the answers. In the Villa dei Mysteri, once highly secret pictures reveal an explanation of the Dionysus cult. Knowledge of the cult was passed on to children in sacred scrolls. The rites had to observe strict rules. Weird masks and charade-like transformations were just as much involved as wine and music to reach a state of ecstasy. Seeking that ecstatic moment in pleasure and pain, that was the cult of the god Dionysus. Such oriental excesses were seen to be a real threat to the unstable Roman society under Octavian. Anthony Mary 
sees Cleopatra and lets himself be hailed as a pharaoh, a nightmare for the citizens of Rome. It all began when Anthony and Cleopatra met in Tarsus. The more Anthony bound himself to Cleopatra, the more he lost sight of Roman interests. The man who had set out to conquer new lands for Rome was now just squandering its spoils. He begins to hand over the eastern provinces he has conquered for Rome to Cleopatra and her children. In Rome, everybody knows that Anthony is the hapless victim of Cleopatra's secret drugs and charms of love. I don't think he was a physically victim of drugs, but he was like in dreams. This uh, rough general of the Roman army coming to, uh, to Alexandrian court to see all these uh, he couldn't see then uh, everywhere in, in, the, in his army and music, dances, uh, perfumes, uh, all this uh, Hellenistic luxury industry in Alexandria, glass, gold, everything. So it was like in a dream. This was a dream in his uh, life in Alexandria. That was the real drugs, the actual drugs in his life in Alexandria. This is the man who will put an end to this madness. Octavian, later hailed as Augustus, was the young pale nephew of Caesar. Nobody had expected much of him. Off the coast of Greece, the fate of Rome is in his hands. Will it remain the center of the ancient world, or will East triumph over West? On September 2nd, 31 BC, the opposing forces face each other at Actium. 500 large, heavy ships of Anthony and Cleopatra versus 300 lighter, smaller boats of Octavian. Hollywood reenacted this historic battle. Sie reißen unsere Reihen auseinander. Antonius ist nun ganz allein, abgeschnitten. Und jetzt setzen sie ihn zu wie die Meute im Wald dem verletzten Bären. Octavian and his general Agrippa proved to be more skilled at strategy. But it is not this which decides the outcome of the battle. Rather, Cleopatra's strange behavior. Anthony cannot believe his eyes. Cleopatra segelt schwarz. Sie lässt mich im Stich. Mein Feldherr. Mein Feldherr. Unsere Verluste sind schwer. Die Lage ist verzweifelt. Antonius, unsere Männer brauchen dich. Sie brauchen deinen Zuspruch. Die Sterbenden schreien nach dir. Die Lebenden flehen dich um Hilfe. Du kannst sie nicht verlassen. With a small fleet of ships, Cleopatra simply leaves the scene of battle, and Anthony follows her. His soldiers are left alone in battle without a general. Octavian has no trouble defeating them. Experts agree that Cleopatra left her husband to win over the victor of the battle, Octavian. But here, she was not to succeed. Cleopatra had turned 39, and her charms had no effect on a rather withdrawn Octavian. In Alexandria, the end is nigh. Like frightened animals, the inhabitants of Alexandria take cover as danger closes in. Will victorious Rome take revenge on Alexandria? Will there be a bloodbath? Her game is over. Cleopatra's dream of an oriental empire with Alexandria as its capital is shattered forever. It is said that long whistles were to be heard in Alexandria during the following nights. The inhabitants told each other it was the sound of the god Dionysus leaving the city as if it were a sinking ship. Marching into the city, Octavian meets no resistance. The lively city of Alexandria falls into a state of deep depression. Anthony tries to kill himself and throws himself on his sword. Like the city of Alexandria and the whole of Egypt, he dies a slow death.
Cleopatra wishes to avoid such an end for herself. She remembers all too well how her sister was led as war booty in chains through the streets of Rome. She hides in an underground tomb. Here, she will survive for three weeks, hoping to win over Octavian with her Egyptian charm. But her world slowly crumbles around her. Anthony dies of his self-inflicted wounds in her arms. Cleopatra is said to have embalmed his corpse single-handedly. As a pharaoh, this Roman general will make his way to the kingdom of the dead, mourned by Cleopatra. As Plutarch wrote, everything she did was done with devotion. When she loved, she loved completely. When she hated, she hated with fervor. And when she mourned, she mourned with her whole heart. And when Cleopatra died, she died like a pharaoh with the poison of the cobra, the snake which was always the symbol of the divine in Egypt. Cleopatra died at the age of 39. With her died an idea that had ruled her life, the idea of an Egyptian Roman Empire under her command, stretching from Spain to Asia. Once she died, her legend sprang to life, the tale of a woman well-versed in the art of love who seduced one Roman leader after another. But it was not love which motivated Cleopatra. It was the vision of a calculating, passionate woman who wanted only one thing in life, a world where the Egyptian pharaohs would rise again. <laughs>